Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have Michael Smith, who's one of the top business leaders. Michael's held top posts at many companies, which we'll get into. He has a proven track record in e-commerce and direct marketing, spanning more than a quarter of a century. He was CEO, just to list a few things of, of where he had top posts at. There's a long, long laundry list. He was CEO of Land's End, CEO of Life Sketch, president of Nordstrom.com, CEO of Classmates, CEO of United Online, CEO of the New Bag, Borrow, or Steal, CEO of Full Circle, and he's a board member at REI and advisor at UW-Madison, which is my alma mater and his as well, at the Entrepreneurship Center. Michael, thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here, Jeremy. Hey, one, one correction to yeah. that, sorry. Uh, the CEO of Classmates, United Online owned Classmates. Okay. So I don't want to supersede uh, the CEO <laughs> of United Online. <laughs> That's fine. No, yeah. when, I, when I list that long laundry list of CEO positions, what comes up for you? You know, I have been really lucky. Um, you know, I, I, I like to tell people, you know, my, my brother, my older brother and younger brother are the hard workers in the family. I've got to do something that I, that I really like and have fun at so I don't have to work. And, you know, so I've found positions that I've, I've really enjoyed and worked with, with great people uh, along the way. And to me, that's the only way that, that uh, you know, you can really get a fulfilling um, work experience. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when I hear the list, I think of all the great companies that I've worked for and all the great people uh, at those companies and the great things that we did uh, during that time. Yeah, and I'm excited to hear your big lessons learned, some of the mistakes along the journey, what worked, what didn't work. And I always like to include a fun fact, a uh, fun fact that maybe most people don't know about you, uh, that you take on foster dogs at your home. And at the peak, one peak, you had nine dogs at a time. What's the That's best right. part about having foster dogs? You know, uh, we, we get a lot of puppies now, and uh, it, it's a great break from stress of work or other pressures. Uh, they, puppies, dogs just love you as long as you give them a little bit of attention. Yes. Uh, they are great therapy. Yes, it's unconditional love. Um, exactly. So I wanted to find out early on, before the CEO days, what was a big influence for you growing up? Yeah, you know, uh, my dad was, was a big influence. Uh, I didn't have uncles. Um, and so we didn't have family around, um, and you know he was a very hard worker, um, and would talk about ethics, doing the right thing. You always have to live with yourself. You always have to look yourself in the mirror, feel good about what you do, um, and 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 also he said, you know, early on you might not have jobs that that you necessarily like, but you know you got to put your time in and learn what you can and then build on that over time and um, so that was that was a great influence uh, to me what did he do he actually worked in accounting okay. um, and so ironically it's an area that that I you know one thing I learned in accounting class where you have to tie to the penny um, that drive me crazy so marketing <laughs> where as long as you're close work, I feel like CEOs I, I are big that picture that big picture people. So it's funny. So how did you get into like kind of the entrepreneur CEO role from your dad's accounting background? Yeah, you know, Is that's something early question. on that was influenced you or, or motivated you. I, you know, I read a lot, um, as a kid and, um, you know, interestingly, I, I, I first wanted to be a forest ranger, oh. uh, was, was what I wanted to do. And I loved the outdoors and, and all that. Um, and then in high school, I, I did a little research on it, and I, I found out that, one, the job opportunities are very limited, so it's highly competitive. Is it dangerous? Is it dangerous or no? Well, I, you know, I think some, some are, but, yeah. but some not so much. Um, and the pay is very low, um, and I thought, ah. Eh. So I, you know, 
I decided to go down the path of I'll go down the path of business, and in my free time, I can spend time in the outdoors doing right. things, and right. you know, yeah. still get win-win. And I and guess so, board member of REI kind of fulfills some of that, right? It does. Yes, absolutely. It's a great, great experience. Did you grow up like around the outdoors? I did. Yes. Uh, you know, hunting and fishing and camping. We had a cabin where we'd spend summers up there. So that was on the water. Um, and so just spent a lot of time outside. Um, you know, you'd, you'd leave home in the morning and sometimes be gone all day and, you know, get little, little different times, uh, more innocent times. But, uh, but I love the outdoors and uh, I think they're, it's a precious resource for us that we need to preserve and pass on to our kids. So your dad, Michael said, you have to endure some of the bad jobs. What were some of your worst jobs that you had to put up with? You know, I, I didn't have to, I mean, because he was telling me that from an early age, I was prepared to put in years of, of you know, really tough things that I, that I hated. And, and fortunately, I, I didn't have to do a lot of that. But, um, you know, I started with the paper route when I was 10 years old, and then I caddied, and, and, uh, and then I got a job at Perkins and, um, you know, started out as a busboy. Which was, uh, which was a tough job, and um, you know, then I started to work the uh, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. Oh, wow. Uh, Friday and Saturday night, um, and so that was tough. You How know, old were you I, at the time? Because that's a... Uh... Well, yeah, I was in high school, yeah. um, so you know, a lot of my friends would be going out and staying out and doing all kinds of things, and I would have to you know, then leave to go to work at uh, 11 at night. Um, and then, you know, I had to deal with one of the hardest parts about that was uh, I was 24, you know, obviously 24 hours and we'd get the bar rush and people would come in at bar time and of course they weren't always behaving properly and, you know, end up getting sick and, you know, oh, <laughs> there were some, horrible. <laughs> some tough parts of, of that. Uh, but, you know, you got to put in your time. Right. So what, when you, after college, what did some of the early days of your career look like? What did you do? Yeah, you know, even at Perkins, you know, I wore a lot of hats. So I was a busboy, I was a dishwasher, I was a cook for a while, and then, you know, got moved up to what was called the shift supervisor, which was effectively an assistant manager without the title and pay. So, you know, got an experience for leading people and, you know, motivating people, things like that, and liked it. Um, you know, I thought that was great working with people and, you know, pleasing the customer and finding ways to improve things. And so my first, one of my first jobs, um, actually the first job this summer was working lawn, landscaping. So a lot of, you know, to literally cutting grass. Manual labor type of stuff. Manual labor, yes. Uh, but then uh, I did a, as a sales job, uh, selling uh, like door to door and, and um, you know, events, things like that for high-end cookware in China and, and stoneware, stuff like that, which was a hard job. Um, and, you know, i not naturally a salesperson. Um, and I think everybody, particularly in marketing or I mean, even in business, you know, you're, everybody's in sales to a degree. So it was great, great experience um, and learned a lot about selling and how to sell and how to communicate, talk to people. And then got a job, uh, an internship at Quaker Oats. Well, before uh, that, what was a big takeaway from going door to door? Because that's not an easy thing to do. And I'm sure you took some of that onto your, your career. Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. But, you know, even, even when I was a paper boy, um, we would go out and uh, it was our, our manager, we'd go to neighborhoods and we would sell newspaper subscriptions door to door. So, you know, 10, 11 years You've old. You've been doing it forever. I got a taste of it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think the, the, the main, there's a couple main things about that. One is you have to believe what you're selling, you know, that it's a good thing and, mm -hmm. you know, be, believe in that. And you have to learn to, you know, not take no personally. Because the fact is, even with a successful business, the majority of people are going to say no. Um, and you, you can't let it bother you. It just flows off, yeah. and you go on to the next person, and um, so those are probably the that's two a good one. Things. It's 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 easier said than done when you're in the moment, but looking back, it's probably if you keep that in mind, it's not as harsh. No, that's right. It, it is, it, and and the thing is, you know, it's not like your sales come in, a, in an even flow, right? It's not like every fifth sale, you know, fifth person you get a sale. 
So you will go through slumps, you know, where you might talk to 20 people or 25 people and they all say no. And, and so keeping your confidence up yeah. in that slump is, yeah. is really critical. It's sort yeah. of like a batting slump. Yeah. You know, you, you, you start to press and, yeah. you know, you're not at your best. And so, you know, you've just got to have that, main, maintain that where every presentation is your best, regardless yeah. of what it is. And, you know, it's got to be like Reggie Miller. Every shot you take, you think is going to go in. <laughs> So what do you do? How many of the last ten have? What do you do to combat that slump? Because I'm sure it happens, you know, still today for everyone. What do you do mentally? You step back, take the big picture, and you know now I can draw on you know successes and say I've been through this before. Mm -hmm. I know we'll figure it out, and think through. You know, there's a process. So if if sales are down, and like now it's an e-commerce company. Why are they down? Break it, break it apart. Break apart the problem. You know, so you lay down. Are they down because you've got fewer, less traffic coming to your site? Are they down because you've got conversion rate down? If it's conversion, where in the funnel are you losing people? Are they falling off at one point because it's, so you break down the problem mm-hmm. and then you can usually see where the breakdown is and then address that and fix it. Yeah, because I remember uh, reading a review of one of your colleagues about you, he said he's no matter what under pressure, he's level headed. So I knew you'd have a good good response for that. And so next you said was your internship at Quaker Oaks? Yes. So what happened? Yeah, that was um, a great, you know, kind of my first taste of real professional corporate life. And it was um Is that in Chicago? Was it was. Okay. Yeah, yeah cuz I'm in Chicago, so I I thought that it was headquartered here. Yeah. It, yes, it, it was, and I think still is. Um, and that was actually also a sales sales job. Um, so we were selling to the stores, um, and then one day a week we were in the office doing some type of sales or marketing project. So, so there we also went through sales training. Um, you know, first learned the product, and then the pro- you know all that. Um, and they talked a lot about the business uh, overall and margins and margin management and and optimizing you know product mix to optimize the margin overall and what were you, you know, selling just, what what products yeah so it was it was you know pretty much all the quaker products so Anything. Quaker cereals quaker wow. oatmeal uh the dog food uh cat food they had um uh you know some some of the hot cereals uh as well so it um, i mean they had good product i mean i, I like yeah. their their product and um, one of the one of the new products they introduced at the time was called Havsies. I don't know what that which, is. Which was uh, yeah, it, it didn't. It's not around That's today. Right. But um, the concept was it was a a sweetened cereal with half the sugar of a of a regular sweetened cereal. So that makes so sense. So that was great to be part of that product launch and they you know that we were insiders to the to the TV promotions and. And the promotions that they had to the stores and the retailers, and you know, really got to watch, uh, you know, how a major company launches a new yeah. product. Um, so why didn't it work? That seems like actually a good idea. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it lasted for a while. I think, um, I mean, it's a very competitive space right. um, with some really well-established uh, products, and I think it just wasn't, it wasn't good enough in the end to compete with. You know, Captain Crunch and and you know all all the others that are out there. Yeah, that's scary though. That Quaker Oats launching it. If they can't compete, then who's going to be able to compete? Well, they their approach, like most retailers, is you know you're going to launch a bunch of new products, and you know their their goal is to have a good batting average. They know they're not going to bat a thousand. Right. So. Uh, you know, they, they try to optimize their mix and learn and learn from that and do better next time. What did they do on that launch that you saw worked really well that you still uh, think about or, or take to this day? I think they did a great job of training the salespeople. I think they their marketing and media mix was well thought out and, you know, geographically targeting customers, the message that they were sending, who they were talking to. Um, you know, in the sales training, you know, answering objections, um, 
What are objections to a good sugar, a good cereal with half the sugar in it? Well, like one would be, why do I need another, you know, another product? Okay. They could either, they're either going to want the sweetened cereal or, you know, the regular sweetened cereal. And so, well, no, they may not. There's, we found in our research, there's actually a significant number of people who like the sweetened cereal, but the amount of sugar really troubles them, especially for their kids. Gotcha. And so this is, it, so, you know, it's, it's going through that, that process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what was next after, after Quaker Oats? So uh, that was junior year. And, um, and then senior year, uh, actually, I was planning on going, going to grad school. And I got an internship at Land's End. And it was uh, in market research, uh, which I loved. I had a minor in statistics and uh, worked on a, um, a pricing model with uh, this professor from the University of Chicago. And, you know, it was fascinating. Uh, you know, you're looking at all the variables that come into play. And, and what it was, was this is for, for uh, liquidation products. So it wasn't pricing for a new product. So it was a product that we had for some period of time. And for whatever reason, we were discontinuing, yeah. you know. And, and so then it was, what are all the variables that go into that? And, and so the key was optimizing the price to sell. So in theory, what you want is that the last, the last unit of demand that you get from customers sells the last unit of inventory that you have in stock. Right, so that's of course the holy grail, right. and you you never hit that. But the goal is to try to get as close to that as possible. So, what did you find? You know, a, a couple things. I mean, one is is people, customers as groups, are very predictable, and and then using that history, so the history on that product, um, you you know what the sales trends are. You have to control for seasonality and holidays and changes in holidays, but you know you can establish a baseline then, and then you know within the category or line you want you want a group of like products to come up with a pricing curve, and um, you know you. Do you remember one of those products that you actually took, you know, out of the inventory and actually sold? Remember? Oh, there were. It was applied to a lot of products. Okay. I mean, we would have literally hundreds of products at the end of every season. So, so we would have that model, and it, it might vary by category or line, but then it would be applied to all the new products. Um, and, and we would have both products that was just, were discontinued completely, and even more so, we had colors that were discontinued. Ah. So we want to freshen up the, the line, you know, we're going to get rid of these colors because they're a small percent of the business and we're going to introduce new colors and, you know, but you've got the same, you know, the same variables, some of the same variables on, on pricing. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that was fascinating. So I'm actually, you know, obviously when I introduced you, um, you know, I saw, I see CEO of Land's End. So you started there. So how'd you get from there to CEO? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, right place at the right time. Um, little luck never hurts. Um, so early on, you know, in I was in what was called at the time the circulation area. Uh, today it's called direct marketing. And so very early on was had a big responsibility of forecasting sales for the company, customer acquisition, um, things like that. And I was single. You know, I had a lot of time, so I put in a ton of hours. And one of the things that kind of broke through is we had um, we had a tough season where we missed plan um, year over year. We still had strong sales growth. I mean, but instead of you know instead of forty percent growth, maybe it was thirty five percent growth or something like that. And so so I did a detailed analysis by catalog, by customer segment, uh, by month, and broke it down and broke down that variance as to why. Um, and the reason was, and it's pretty obvious in hindsight, is we introduced um, some what we call prospect catalogs, which were fewer pages than the, the main catalogs. And we didn't, we didn't spend much time forecasting those. And we were way off on the forecast for those. We forecast too much. You know, we assumed they were going to do 
too similar. We used a dollars per book forecasting mechanism without considering the pages. And so pretty simple stuff, really, uh, at the end of the day, looking back on it. But it, we hadn't done it before. And so, you know, people start talking around the company. Wow, this young kid comes in and, you know, gives us a lot of insight. Um, Did you do that on your own or was someone actually asking you to do certain things and you just kind of took it to the next level? No, so that was that I did on my own. Oh wow! Uh, and and so because we didn't have it wasn't like Quaker Oats where we had a lot of staff and resources and um, so it was a very small group. So I got to to learn some coding and Easy Tree and um, you know VisiCalc at the time and then Lotus and and it was it was fun. Um, and so I mean there were a couple nights where I you know worked through the night because. Yeah, I got nothing better to do, and it was exciting, and right. and um, so yeah, it was it was great. So I, you know, I could make a name for myself and get noticed, um, you know, doing that. I because it was sales for the whole company. A lot of times, I was presenting to senior management and even to the board at times. Um, so got visibility there, and um, and then Dick Anderson actually, who was uh, president and CEO for a while. And David Zentmeyer, um, Bill Ferry, you know, they, they were great and recognized that, you know, I had some potential and so really put me on a program to move into different areas and try different things. And, and so really was very lucky to have that opportunity and to, to move into other areas as well. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's big positions in Land's End that's not the CEO, you know, that you could have landed and stuck with. How did you get to that top tier uh, CEO? Yeah, so the progression was, you know, it was circulation first, and then I was running circulation, um, and then I moved into, um, let's see, trying to get this. Actually, from there, went and headed a group uh, that uh, was in charge of, of putting together an inventory management system. So there's a group of about five of us um, and put together is about a year, whole new inventory management system um, that last I heard was still being used. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know, is that good or not good? Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I guess it survived the time, <laughs> okay. but they may be behind on updating it. But um, so that was great. I also early on, we, you know, when I started, we were one, one main catalog, the Core Lands End catalog. And, you know, in terms of growth, I was one of the people that was involved in, you know, the sales growth for the company. And we talked about, you know, we should spin off, you know, these different businesses. So the first business that we spun off was the kids business. And I was on a, a team that launched the kids business. Dave Zentmeyer headed the team and I did the marketing on it. And um, so it was great. It was successful from the beginning and took off. and. And, you know, we had a bunch of kids customers already. Right. So from a circulation marketing standpoint, yeah. you know, I, I could do all the math and forecasting and I had a pretty good idea of what it was going to do. And then the next business that we spun off. What was did you do that worked with that one? Well, you know, really started with kids buyers. And so the forecasting model, and we had 30 million members, um, customers at the company. Yeah. And so deciding who to target was critical. And so looking at what are the key variables. Yeah, who do you target? I mean, you could target boys, girls, you could target, I, I mean, a lot of things. Yeah, the, the most, the strongest variables is past buying history. Okay. So anybody, the, the first group is anybody who bought kids product in the past. And then you look at other products. So maybe people who bought women's products have kids. Okay, so we'll look at that and run some correlations, see what it looks like, put a model together. And then, of course, after you mail your first catalog, now you have history to see what worked, what didn't, and then you can refine that yeah. over time. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's, it's always iterative. Um, and then I moved into the second business we spun off was the home business. And there, I kind of interesting, I, I was a buyer, which was great because, you know, Land's End, I mean, the merchandising was critical. So I learned how critical buying was. And because the, the powers that be at the time said, well, you can do the marketing in your sleep. So why don't you do both? Okay. <laughs> so, so literally had two full-time jobs wow. 
Um, and, and, you know, that was successful, you know, did it, had some success and then became managing director. And so ran the whole home, home business. Wow. Um, and, and that was successful, you know, from the beginning. Um, and then actually, and, and, you know, not a lot of people know this, but, uh, you know, I had the entrepreneurial bug, uh, at the time. So, so I actually resigned from the company. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, the idea was I was going to do, I don't know, in, in Europe, you know, the travel over there is all packages. And you walk into a travel agency and three walls are travel packages. And in the U.S., it was not, you know, even today is not like that. So my idea was, you know, to take that, translate it to the U.S. And so I bought a travel agency and I resigned. And um, Why and a travel went, agency? That seems random coming from Land's End. Well, it was applying the direct business, the concepts to the travel business. And so I looked at, you know, all the different businesses that were out there and ideas. And, and of course, apparel was highly competitive. Right. And so I looked at that. But, you know, in my estimation, it was going to take a lot more capital. Yeah, yeah. Because of the inventory requirements and because of how competitive it was. Yeah. Whereas travel, you don't have any inventory. And it was dominated by mom and pops. So the sophistication level with the industry was not that high. Yeah. So that, that's why I ended up uh, with it. that. So what happened? So I get a call from Gary Comer. I'd already resigned. Um, I was still there. So I had given two weeks or four weeks or whatever. Uh, and he said, hey, I'd like you to come out to uh, the farm. You know, he had a farm out there. And uh, This could be good or not good, if you, especially if it was a shotgun. And you resigned. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't know, no. but I had already resigned, so I was like, you yeah, know, whatever. Uh, yeah. I didn't know if he was gonna me for, you know, turning my back on the company or, or what. But anyways, the long and short of it is, he said we'd like you to become CEO. Wow. Um, and so uh, you know, most people think it'd be slam dunk. Of course, I'm gonna do that, um, but it wasn't. You know, because I'd always wanted to do. You know, the entrepreneurial thing, I bought a travel agency. You already bought it. Yeah, yeah, I already had it. Um, and so I said, I, I said, you know, Gary, I love the company, really appreciate uh, the offer. Let me think about it uh, and, and come back. And so um, I thought about it. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, I, I thought, you know, look, I just, just turned 34. Um, you know, the opportunities for me to be in this role come up once in a lifetime probably yeah. and and I can always go back if this doesn't work I can always you know launch a business you know down the road so I decided to, to take it mm -hmm. um, and it was um, it was quite quite the ride um, you know so uh, you know we were public at the time and um, so and, you know you might have seen some of the articles and everything every art first it was a shock to Wall Street and uh, I think every article, or 99%, started with 34-year-old Mike Smith. Um, <laughs> you know, no previous experience, you know, running a CEO, blah, blah, blah. A lot of pressure. Uh, yeah, it was a lot of pressure. Um, but it was great. So, you know, when we announced it, we issued the press release. We had everybody. We would have company meetings in the gym out at Land's End. So we, we literally had, you know, it was in the thousands of people all in the gym, around the track overhead and, wow. and you know Gary got up and, and I had no idea you know if I was gonna get booed or you know I just I didn't you know. You thought you were gonna get booed? Well I didn't know. Oh, you yeah. know I mean you know the, the Bill N was a great guy, likable guy and um, so I didn't know. Um, yeah. I mean I knew a lot of people that I'd been at, with the company for over 10 years but um, but anyways, Gary got up and nobody knew, you know, at that point. And then he made the announcement and everybody just broke out in applause. That's and, great. I mean, it was, it was great. Um, a lot of fun and um, just the whole thing was a great experience. And, you know, I made some changes in management and people and people that I knew were great people, put them in senior positions and they did really well. And, you know, it was when I, when I took over as CEO, I think we were, I don't know, eight or nine hundred million in sales. When I left, we were a billion four. Wow! Um, and it was it was great, great, Congrats. great. Experience. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It so, was. what are some of the big things you did, changes you made while you were there in your interim CEO while you were uh, heading the company? 
Yeah, a uh, couple things. I mean, first, you know, I, I made very clear uh, to the company, look, culture is not going to change. You know, the things that the company was founded on, customer service, quality, you know, those, those are rock solid and are not going to change. Um, and, you know, I think there's a ton of opportunity. And so I'm going to work with the team, senior leaders, to, um, you know, determine what those are. I will communicate those. I will get input. So the first thing is just letting people know there's not going to be any major layoffs. Because they're scared things. that something's going to yeah, drastic yeah. Gonna happen. Okay. Um, and second thing is putting the right people in the right positions. You know, it's like I'm a big fan of the good to great, built to last. Getting the right people on the bus in the right seats is yeah. absolutely critical. Um, and then, you know, it was a process. And, you know, like I said, Bill is a great guy, very smart, the former CEO. But we had some, some different approaches. Um, and whereas Bill didn't really see as much opportunity within the current business and, and felt that we needed to do M&A and acquire companies to grow, I had the opposite viewpoint. I, I saw tons of opportunity and, and so really shifted to focus on those and, you know, put money behind uh, international. One of the first initiatives was to launch Lanzen.com. And what was it before? There was, there was, there was not, there so was no was, website. No, no. So this was, was 94. Okay. So this is, and, yeah. um, so we were always very involved and I was involved, you know, with Dave Zentmeyer and some of the other people with interactive media. So you might be, I think you're old enough to remember Prodigy, you know, the IBM, Sears. Um, so interactive TV, I mean, we, we believed in that and, and we, you know, firmly believed that that was the wave of the future. So when the internet came along, you know, we were all over it. We said, look, this, this is awesome. And so it was interesting when I presented to the board, I said, look, this is going to be big and I'm going to make this a major initiative. How did you know that at the time? Well, because it had all the elements of the direct business, whereas a lot of people thought the Internet was going to displace catalogs. I mean, I think those of us who are familiar with it said, we are the best position to take advantage of this. Right. We have a huge customer base already. Now we can, we can contact our people through email, yeah. whereas before it was costing Very us a cheap. bucket catalog. Yeah. We can make changes right away, whereas before you mail a catalog, and it's like your store is frozen in time. So even after you run out of things, products still sitting on the shelf, even when things aren't selling, you know, you still have them featured. Um, so it, it was a slam dunk. And, and the board was mostly people, older people. Right. Um, and they were not excited about that at all. And at the end, I was still in my honeymoon period. And so basically they said, you know what, go ahead and do this, but don't take your eye off the ball, you know, for the main business. Um, and so launched it, put Dave Zentmeyer in charge of it, um, who had the golden touch with new businesses. And it went from 5 million to 28 to 80 to 200. Wow. Um, and when That's I amazing. left, when we, when I left, we had a huge lead out there and, you know, a little different approach after I left. And now it's still a good business, but I think we could have been much bigger. Um, but it was great. That's was a great. huge foresight. How did you, what other, like at the time, when you launched Lamzen.com, what other sites were even on the web? Do you remember? Yeah, it's interesting. So Amazon was out there. They were, okay. 95, classmates. Um, but, you know, very few. I mean, there were... Because it's almost like you're pioneering. You don't see what other people are doing. You're almost carving a track. Cause there oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they, there was no general agreement that this was going to work. And, you know, again, publicly, the analysts early on were saying, you know, look out, Land's End. You know, the Internet's going to eat their lunch, you know, once they start. Um, but, yeah, early on it was... And remember, it was... You know, like the board would point out to me, it's slow, you can't do things like, like it, right. yes, but Moore's Law is, you know, it, it's going to change rapidly. And the learning that we get along the way is going to be critical yeah. to maintaining our leadership. Yeah. Um, and that's what happened. Um, so it we just seems a, so obvious now, but at the time, it's not at all. And probably you were getting a lot of pushback. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, as far as lessons, 
for entrepreneurs. I mean, I hear people say, geez, all, all the good ideas have been taken. And, you know, I say, you know what? Two years from now, you're going to look back and see a number of obvious ideas right. that you didn't think of. So there's always, always ideas out there to yeah. take advantage of. I like that. So then what, how did you transition then from Land's End to, to Life Sketch? Yeah, so, so great, great question. Um, you know, I started to get pressure from the board to really hype the stock um, and, interestingly, pressure from the board to cut the catalog. And, you know, understandably, I mean, we were spending, I don't know, $100 million a year on paper. But we had tested, and we were good at testing. I mean, we were very sophisticated. And so, so we would test mailing a catalog versus not mailing a catalog, incremental profitability. We knew what, what would happen if you didn't mail the catalog. And this is another learning where, you know, as a board, um, they just felt that you just got to do it. You got to be bold and, and go for it. And I, you know, I said, look, I guarantee you this will not work. And so after I left, the new CEO came in, cut, cut catalogs pretty significantly in the fourth quarter, and they lost almost $100 million in sales wow. in one quarter. And it took them almost three years to get back to the sales level that they were when I left. Why did they do that if you've already put this forecasting model in place and you've predicted it? What made them decide to do it? You know, it's, it's the, one of my learnings. Um, ego and emotion are just as important as logic, even with smart people. And, you know, at the time, and, and the politics comes into play. So there was, you know, a couple board members who were really behind the scenes, you know, lobbying to do this. And to me at the time, and, you know, I'm a first time CEO, um, and it was so obvious to me that I just did not put, you know, a lot of effort into talking to, you know, each board member and lobbying and all that because it was, it was so obvious. How could you decide to do something different? <laughs> you right. know, was my point of view. And at right. the end of the day, um, you know, they, they felt that that was the way to go yeah. and everybody would just automatically go to the web. And, of course, it, you know, over time it happened. Um, but but not that quick. So that was a, a learning experience and, and interesting. I mean, obviously, while you were there, there was a huge trajectory upwards. What were some of the tough parts? You know, we we had I mean, we had a great run. Uh, when I started, we were I think less than a hundred million, um, and when I left, we were a billion four. Wow. Uh, we were one catalog. When I left, we were about fifteen different businesses in half a dozen countries around the world. Um, and, you know, we had great process, um, you know, like going over internationally, uh, REI did not have a great experience uh, internationally. And, and when I joined the board was just licking, we were just licking our wounds. We were deep in debt um, because at Land's End, we took the approach of, okay, we're going to go into another country, but we're going to have a senior, senior person, um, you know, local from the company partnered with somebody from, from Dodgeville. And so, you know, there were learnings like that that we were fortunate enough to listen to people to take advantage of and sometimes not listen to people. So, for example, in, in Japan, we were told you can't go in there without a joint venture with a local company. And that made us nervous because our culture, our approach to business was so key and we just, we just didn't feel comfortable yeah. that... You have that, to find like a company. perfect fit if you're going to do that. Yeah, and so we did it on our own, and it worked great. So, you know, I would say the, um, the toughest thing at, uh, at Land's End was at the end. You know, when we had the differences, the board wanted to, you know, hype the Internet and, and cut catalogs, and, and I just didn't believe that that was the right thing to do. And I, mm -hmm. you know, again, I thought, great time to, you know, do the entrepreneurial thing. Um, and so, it, you know, it worked out, worked out fine in the end. Um, but it was, you know, it was hard to leave, uh, you know, at the time, you know, I was making, you know, in total a million dollars a year and options and, and all that. And uh, so, yeah, that's a, know, that's a tough, tough pill to swallow. Hard, hard to walk away from that. Yeah. And, and, you know, at the time, I didn't know how I would, how I would feel about it. You know, I had, 
you know, my dad, who very much had, you know, memories of the Depression and, and all that, is like, boy, you don't walk away from a job like this without having another job in hand. Right. Um, so you and, didn't have another you know, job. And, you didn't have another job at all after, no, when that happened. No. Oh, so, wow. So I decided to leave and go start my own business. So I had to, had to research, you know, what I was going to do. And, you know, that's when I launched LifeSketch. Um, but I didn't know that, you know, what it was going to be. I had to, you know, build the team and the, I had to come up with the idea and, and all that. So what was um, LifeSketch, the original idea? It was an early version of Shutterfly. Okay. And uh, it was awesome. I mean, we had the best functionality by far of putting together things. And, and the downside, you know, was that, you know, the Internet just did the ad adoption of broadband um, just wasn't as fast as, you know, I got a little bit You're drinking too the Kool-Aid of how fast everything was going to go. And yeah. so our broadband customers were incredibly profitable and highly engaged. Um, the dial-up customers, you know, with images, that was a painful experience. And um, so... That was that was tough, but um, but again, another great experience. Worked with great people and um, a, a building block. So, what was the big lesson that you had at, at Life Sketch? Well, one, I think you know, don't get caught up in the hype. Um, I, I mean, you can look at look back, and that cycle repeats itself over and over again. Going back to what is it, the seventeen or eighteen hundreds, the tulip uh, bubble. Um, right. I mean, it's interesting, like every 50 to 80 years, there's this huge bubble of, you know, locomotion or automobiles or, so it's like, you know, the basic fundamentals don't change. You know, you can have new things, but it's still, you have to build a customer list, you have to have good margins, you have to be able to source a product, those things are not going to change. And people are people, and, and frankly, a lot of our emotion and things like that hasn't changed from the caveman days. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's the, the learning. So as I get into new businesses, absolutely adopt new technologies, but you're not going to change fundamental behaviors of people. Um, you know, you, you're going to have to appeal to the same things that get them excited and appeal to them. And, and yeah. so I think separating those things, you just have to go through that exercise and step back once in a while. So what was then the transition from life sketch and what brought you to then to be president of Nordstrom.com. Yeah, so... Um, it's another Nordstrom, big jump. Yeah, it was... Um, so Dan Nordstrom, um, who's great, uh, one day he was flying on their private plane back from New York to Seattle, and he uh, gave me a call. He said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop in Madison. You want to meet for a drink? Um, how did you know him? You know, that's a good question. I'm not sure how... It's like I, Dan Nordstrom didn't call me. I mean, no, I'm just... I, you know, I don't, um, I don't know. Maybe he cold called me. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. But but That's anyways, flattering. Okay. He uh, he comes in. We we hit it off. Um, I really liked him. Um, you know, we, we we just really hit it off. So he he had asked me to join the company as as president at the time. And I said, look, I've got, you know, I've got this life sketch thing going on. I really have to see it through. I've got investors, employees that I've brought on. Um, I, so I have to do that. Um, so he said, well, great. Um, how about if you join the board? So I said, yeah, sure. That, that'd be fun. So join the board, and, uh, which was a great experience. I could get an inside view of it and, and gave me my first exposure to venture capital. Um, so Benchmark was an investor. Bill Gurley, who you may know, is uh, very well known. He was on the board. Tom Alberg from um, Madrona Ventures was on the board. Um, and uh, really, Pete Higgins, who was from Microsoft. Um, great, great board. And so I was on the board for about a year. And then the recession hit, the, the bubble burst. We couldn't raise more money. And so... It's kind of a long story, but I, I ended up, I was going to be selling LifeSketch to a company out here, actually, uh, PhotoWorks. And um, it was a great, you know, great offer. I was going to be CEO of the, the total company. Um, and then Dan and Bill give me a call and say, we got a better offer for you. And so, you know, without revealing, you know, confidentiality. Yes. They made, I don't they edit made, this, so... 
whatever you can't say, don't say. So. Yeah, no, they, they made, in the end, I mean, obviously they made me an offer I couldn't, couldn't refuse. And so I joined Nordstrom as president and Life Sketch then had the opportunity to, to continue to operate and, you know, provided consulting services to Nordstrom, which provided funds. Um, and, you know, it was, uh, it was a win-win um, for a while. So, so that's how I got to Nordstrom. Um, so what was a big lesson at Nordstrom? What are some big changes that you made to improve the business? Yeah, so one of the, the things, so at Nordstrom, great company, great culture. Yeah. Um, we were doing a ton in sales, so we were plenty big to be profitable. But the company, Nordstrom is very much a promote from within yeah. company. So they just didn't have direct experience. So going in there, um, it was clear looking at the PL what needed to be changed, you know, and there were some real obvious things, low hanging fruit. And uh, so, you know, I got the senior team together and yeah. I said, look, great job, top line, but bottom line isn't working. And, and the unfortunate thing in a retailer, <clears throat> you know, they, they mainly focus on gross margin or gross margin return on, on investment. So from their standpoint, they were doing great because sales were really strong. So I said, look, what matters is top line and bottom line. And every line in this P&L affects the bottom line. Unlike a retailer, where you can have a bad store or even a bad region, and it doesn't affect the others. So anyways, pretty clear what some of the low-hanging fruit was. I got the team together, and I said, look, here's what we need to do. You know, here's a couple of things we need to do right away. You know, boom, boom, boom. So, you know, they, they left. And, you know, I'm not a, an overbearing, you know. No, you don't, you don't seem to be an overbearing. No, no I, I'm not. But anyways, Dan uh, afterwards, and he was great, he said, um, he said, here, can we talk for a bit? I said, yeah, sure. So he said, he said, we don't do that here. And I said, do what? He said, well, we can sort of have the model of the inverted pyramid. And so we have a lot of consensus building and, you know, we, we, we don't do top down, you know, decision making. <laughs> so I said, and we were losing, you know, the year that I joined, we lost almost $30 million. So um, we were losing a ton of money. And so to me, time was of the essence. Right. And so that's, that's why I did it the way I did it. Right. And I said, okay, you know, we can do it that way. It'll take us a little longer, but certainly can, can do it that way. Um, so that was, that was a learning uh, that, you know, culturally you have to understand the culture of, of the company that you're in and, you know, work within that. Um, so, you know, going on, it was, it was great. And Dan and I were great as a team, which was one of the things I was worried about, um, because those things often don't work. Um, but it was, it was great and everything worked well and a great team. And I hired, you know, a bunch of, of very experienced direct marketing people. And so one of the biggest challenges, it wasn't knowing what to do within the business. Because like I said, that was pretty clear to look at the P and L and it was clear to what, you, but obviously people before that it wasn't wasn't so clear. Right, but but to people who had experience in the direct business, you know, I mean, the, the new the new folks that I brought on, it was clear what we needed to do. But mm -hmm. the hard part was the whole cultural piece and having one team that was going to lead this business forward. That and that was exhausting. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you do that? You, I mean, we, you know, Dan was great, and we had a head of HR <clears throat> who was terrific, and we had, you know, a lot of process meetings, and, you know, we had books, you know, Who Moved My Cheese, uh, yeah, you know, we gave everyone Spencer that book, Johnson, yeah. Yeah, and we, we, we talked about change, and, and <clears throat> so we did all of that, we did a lot of um, just one-on-ones, I, I teamed up some of the key people, so they had, the merchant was from Nordstrom, she stayed there. The head uh, of direct marketing came, I hired her. So, you know, try to do things to put them together. You know, go have lunch, you know, sit down, have, have drinks. Um, so it was, you know, and we would have, you know, little parties, gatherings, drinks. I mean, just, it was a lot of that. A lot of relationship <laughs> building and fostering. Yes. Um, is, and then on yeah, the other side, consuming. in terms of process, we introduced, um, you know, a strategic planning process that, look, went through the SWOT analysis, these are the key issues, these are our goals, these are the key initiatives, 
And then on a regular basis, you know, once a month, here's how we're doing. You know, we're hitting these goals, falling a little short here, we have to make an adjustment. So, you know, the combination of that, and obviously when you're hitting your goals, it's a lot more fun and exciting and easier to keep people on the bus right. than when you're missing your goals. Yeah. So, you know, we actually, you know, turn things around. You know, that year we made, you know, eight million, I think, in the fourth quarter. So it, it was a lot quicker than I thought we were going to be able to do it. And it was because of Dan, it was because of the you know, the Nordstrom folks that were there, the team that I brought on, um, and it just really, you know, worked out well. There's a lot, you know, Michael, of moving parts here, you know, in general. What do you think is an essential skill set for a CEO, for a leader? You know, I think it's a combination of people skills that's critical. And those people skills are, you know, knowing how to motivate people, knowing how to bring them together, knowing how to, to, you know, coalesce, you know, a diverse group of people into a team yeah. um, and the process that's involved. So that's one. How Clearly do you, what you have you found that, that, what have you found that works with motivating people or even yourself? Yeah, you, you know, I mean, to me, with either with an individual or a team, you have to find the intersection of passion and skill set. And so... For starters, you have to find people that believe in what you're doing. And so once you have that, then you talk to them about what could be. What could this look like? Mm -hmm. You know, what if? And wouldn't that be awesome? Nobody's done this before, but but we could do it. You know, we've got we've got a unique skill set here that nobody's done before. I see. And you, you know paint like a bigger vision. A paint a bigger yeah. vision for people. I mean, how exciting is that? Yeah. And you know, was um, who was it? Uh, what's his name? The coach of the uh, Notre Dame and um, Lou Holtz. I think it was Lou Holtz who said, "You know, somebody asked him, how do you how do you motivate your players?" And he said something to the effect of, "You know, I don't. I just only have motivated players and get rid of the ones who aren't motivated." <laughs> so part of it is in right. your hiring process. Yeah. You know, you, you have to have a certain DNA. Right. you know, the team. And if you don't, you know, yeah. for whatever reason, you know, yeah. you just can't. I think they it. talk about that in Built to Last, about Nordstrom's and how, when, or maybe in general about those companies, when you get in the culture, it's so, you know, ingrained that the people who don't fit in will leave quickly. Yeah, you very that? often that is the case. And I think in the book, they might have called it, you know, they're spit out. Or, uh, <laughs> I don't, so, yes, that, that's absolutely right. So then, from North or from Nordstrom's now to classmates. Yeah. So um, so Nordstrom Inc. bought back Nordstrom.com, and uh, so Dan and I left the company, and um, you know I wasn't sure what you know what I was going to do, but but anyways, um, Madrona Ventures was uh, an investor in Nordstrom. And so I think it was Tom Alberg and uh, Paul Goodrich, you know, maybe as well. Anyways, we they said let's have lunch. And so I am, you know, always open to that. You know, sure, let's have lunch. And, and anyways, so they talked about classmates, and you know, talked about that opportunity. And long story short, I decided to join classmates. So for uh, people who don't know what's classmates, because you mentioned it in the very you know, earlier on, that is, it was when LandsEnd.com classmates was on the web also. Right, right. So um, so Classmates started out <clears throat> and for much of its life was find your old, reconnect with your old classmates. And <clears throat> so it was, you know, I, I sign up for my school and, you know, they're getting other people to sign up and you get emails, you know, uh, Jeremy, do you know these four people from yes, your high school? Yes. And it was really that simple. And then you would have to pay to connect with them. So it was a really simple model. And when I joined, the challenge was the renewal rate was just too low. And so we had been to the, to the altar in terms of selling the company a couple times unsuccessfully because everybody thought, well, you're going to hit the wall. 
because we had, you know, 25% of the country that went to high school, we already had on our list. Wow. <clears throat> so, so I joined and the, um, the challenge then was to increase the renewal rate and sell the company. And um, so it was great. Again, very strong team of people. I you know, brought in a couple people, but, but very strong team there. And we ended up tripling the renewal rate wow. and selling the company to United Online. Um, and it was, it was great. I mean, it was- uh, So I'm obviously gonna ask, you know, everyone out there wants to know how do they triple their renewal rate? What, <laughs> what do you do? You know, that's the obvious was, question. Yeah, it was it was a, a combination <clears throat> combination of things. Um, you know, Jeremy, can I? Yeah, get some water. I'm gonna get there right next door. Yeah, go ahead. Too much I'm talking you talk here. More than usual. <laughs> this is just uh, fascinating yeah. stuff, Michael. Yes. So I, I have to keep you talking. <laughs> so thanks for I, bearing I, with it. I've, I've been lucky. Um, you know, with all my fundraising. Um, I actually completely lost my voice at, at one point, which pretty hard. It's like when you're campaigning, you need your voice. Um, so anyways, I, I just, when I went in there, I ran into a guy who was coming in to check with me. We actually have a, a sales meeting okay. starting. I didn't know. Um, so, so what do you have? So, so I, um, you know, finish you at uh, reasonable time. So I, I actually need, it starts right now. Okay. We were talking about United Online bought classmates, um, but I didn't want to skip over the fact that you tripled the renewal rate at classmates and what you did. Yeah, so... Um, and for yeah, those of you who don't know, like like a couple hours have passed, you've been to a sales meeting, we came back because this is just too important. So, so go... <laughs> Good memory. Yes. Yeah. So, combination of things, um, you know, the first thing we did was strategically, um, we changed the focus. So, we went from, who do you know, Jeremy, do you know these three friends that you went to high school with, to, do you know them and do you know what they're doing? So, we added this whole concept of content of staying in touch with your former classmates and you can still connect to them with them if you want but a lot of people don't want to connect they just want to we used to call them voyeurs you know they just want to know what's going on and they're Got interested it. in that and new jobs and kids and, and whatever so so that was a fundamental shift there was also some mechanical things that we did in terms of credit card processing things on the site you know, tracking when credit cards were expiring and letting people know so they can update. You know, that's actually, you know, the, the biggest reason for churn is actually credit cards going bad. Mm. It's not people calling up and saying, cancel me. Yeah. So we, we it could be for innocent things. things like just the expiration date on the credit card. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So we addressed a lot of those things. And then, you know, we added other products and features. Um, one of the things that we did was we added a TV show. Hmm. We had almost a hundred episodes of Classmates TV, um, and that was kind of fun. How did you come up with that? Well, we um, we were approached by a, an agent who had the the idea for Classmates TV, which was reunions with with people, and you know he thought that. What we brought to the party is we have these 40 million people that have connections and one of the biggest challenges with the network doing it was how do you access those people and, and so so anyways he you know we we engaged him and he made the pitch and you know we ultimately launched classmates tv and it was uh, it was really cool um you know so we had these um real life you know connections reconnections in various forms and yeah. uh, so what it was, was the most interesting reconnection that you experienced? You know, I think probably it was um, this this guy who uh, was killed in uh, in Vietnam, and he ended up saving the lives of a couple of his buddies. Hmm. And so these two, and this was an unusual one for us, but these two ended up going back to his house and meeting his wife 
and kids. Wow. And it was it was one of those. I mean, literally everybody who had watched it when we first showed it, you know, had tears in their eyes. We we had Kleenex boxes underneath the seats to wow. because you know they, these guys would talk. You know, they, the girls, there were two girls, would ask, um, you know, what was what was my dad like? And you know, he was he was great. Everybody liked him. You know, there was a stray dog that he uh, that he took care of and fed and. Um, you know, I said, well, what kind of music does he like? You know, oh, he loves rock and roll. And the girls would be, oh, we, we love rock and roll. And, you know, it was just, obviously, I'm not giving it justice yeah. at all. But um, it was really powerful. Yeah, it was. Um, and, uh, you know, there were, there were romantic reconnections that were, that were great. And, um, it, you know, some, you know, like where there was bullying going on in high school, you know, reconnections and um, where one so person was bullying the other person. You mean? Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, a lot of times, like I remember this one where this guy had bullied this woman, um, and you know, it was a big deal to her, and he supposedly just didn't even remember. Oh wow! It, you know, it, it happening. So yeah. it was it was pretty Kids interesting. Scar people. Yeah. 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 So it, it, we we did a lot of things and. You know other things to keep people active and engaged, and we did things to encourage people giving content. I mean, the whole user-generated content was a big, a big part of the strategy. I mean, really, it was a precursor to, you know, Facebook and Pinterest and and all those right. things. And um, you know, so it was. It seems like all of these are almost ahead of their time. Yeah, they 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 were and. You know, at the time, we we had big plans to add a lot of this and to be like a Facebook. And one of the challenges was the board. You know, we were pretty profitable, and we were in the sale mode. So, you know, there was there was never the feeling that we wanted to invest money into building these things because we're going to be selling the company. And so it was, you know, now when we sold to United Online, we started to implement those things, and we had a huge increase in both sales and profits uh, while I was there. So, you know, the the early indication was that those things were really working. Once then you I, tripled the renewal rate, did they rethink wanting to sell it? Or was that always the plan? Yeah, that was the plan. You know, we had a founder that had a significant percent of the company and he was, you know, ready to, he was going to make a lot of money. Right. Um, he was ready to get to that point, and um, so it was it was the right thing at the yeah. time. Everybody yeah. won. And my question, Michael, too, is, you know, you mentioned a key fact about what are they doing now, not do you want to connect. How did you come to that? Well, you know, we, as we, you know, the typical approach that I use for strategic planning is, you know, what are your key issues? that come out of the SWOT analysis. And, and one of the key issues is, look, you once you connect, you've connected, right? It's like a binary thing that now the, the switch is flipped. So, so what else can we do to keep people engaged? Mm -hmm. Well, what do we have? Look at, well, we've got all these people who are coming back to the site all the time. What else could we do? So through this brainstorming, we said, well, geez, you know, they could be sending photos and talking about what they're doing and, and you know, and we did some customer research and things like that and decided, you know, we, we looked at, again, the intersection of what was interesting and compelling and engaging to customers with, you know, what, what assets do we have that we can leverage? Mm -hmm. And that's where we, where we came to that. Was that hard to deliver? Because that seems like if you have millions of people going to the site and you have all these pictures and information, and at the time, it's not like we're talking the same, like you were talking about bandwidth and, and everything. Was that difficult? <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, it's challenging. I mean, you had to you had to put some thought into it and and you know iterate. I mean, you try things. What's working? What isn't? Um, but it worked well, um, you know. And so we were on a uh, a very nice trajectory uh, when I left. So then, tell me about once uh, the transition from the classmates and United Online. You you stuck with them right afterwards after the sale. Yeah, I stayed there for, I left in less than a year, but six or seven months later, I left. Um, so I got a call uh, from Adam Dell, um, and uh, he said, I got this concept I'm looking at investing in. I think it'd be great for your background. Okay. And I said, oh, really? What is it? He said, well, it's, it's fashion handbag rental. 
And uh, so my first reaction was, well, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, then I started to think about it and I thought, you know, that's a pretty cool idea because, you know, Nordstrom, <laughs> a lot of people were essentially using us for that uh, in dresses. You know, they buy it, use it, and then return it. Yeah. So anyways, he, he persuaded me to join the company and, um, and I did. And uh, that was a... We could spend a couple hours on that by itself. Um, that was the new bag borrower steal. That's right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So what are so the most exciting? Uh, you know, it sounds like you have some good stories from those days. Yeah, there were a lot of lot of stories there. I mean, you know, when I joined, it was um, low end handbags um, because the higher end designers didn't want to be associated with us, um, and so again, I bring on the team, you know, really step up the level. I mean, we, we knew from our fashion, you know, background that the designers need to be comfortable with their environment, you know, where we're showing them. And, and so, you know, hired a great head of creative, a terrific merchant, you know, marketing. And, and you know, we, we upped the ante. And uh, whereas when I joined, we had one of the top 20 designers direct. When I left, we had six of the top 10. Wow. Direct. So um, huge, you know, huge change. And, you know, with huge impact going from indirect, meaning we would buy it retail um, and rent it, to obviously if you go direct, you get two things happening. First, your cost drops by more than half. But the other thing is you get access to the product. So our sales would increase on those products by 10 to roughly 10 times because we could get access to the product. And so then kind of our coup d'etat was we got a great scene in the movie Sex and the City ah. where Sarah Jessica Parker is talking to Jennifer Hudson and she's got a, uh, you know, so she's interviewing her as a personal assistant. And so she says, I've got one last question. How does an unemployed gal from St. Louis afford a Louis Vuitton bully bag? And Jennifer Hudson said, it's rented, beg, borrow, or steal. Wow. And uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, how did I not know about this? And the fact that she was renting was mentioned four other times in the movie. Wow. So it was a huge home run. I mean, sales immediately took off. Um, and it was really helpful from the designer standpoint because, you know, suddenly they saw that as great validation. That yeah. this is, you know, kind of hit the big time. And you can't get any better validation than that, probably. No, I mean, that was the, the biggest fashion movie. In fact, I think it was the biggest women-oriented movie of the decade. Um, wow. So it was, it was huge. So how'd you get into that movie? They wrote us in. Just, just so by chance? I mean... They, well, they, they, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, the harder you work and the better job you do, the luckier you get. Mm-hmm. So they, somebody there liked us and they wrote us in, the writer wrote us in and they contacted us and said, hey, we wrote you into a scene in Sex of the City, what do you think? Of course, we took all of a quarter of a second to debate that <laughs> one. And um, so we said, great, well, we'll, you know, we'll certainly promote it to the degree that we can and to our customers and it was, it was fantastic. Wow. Uh, yeah, so That's it was, remarkable. It was, how did you get some of those first top designers? Because I would think, okay, once you get a few, the other ones will start to follow. How did you start to get the first few? Yeah, it's um, yeah, that's exactly right. And and so, the first thing was really upgrading the website. You know, make it a place that they want to be. And then it was really leveraging personal relationships. So we, um, you know, we knew people from our Nordstrom days and. You know, we hired a consultant to work with us, you know, on that. He had connections, we had connections, and it was just a lot of meetings, relationship building, convincing them that this is not the person who can't afford the, the couch and has to rent it, you know, the rent to own thing. Mm -hmm. These are people who, you know, they had, you know, hundred thousand dollar plus household income. Mm -hmm. Our average customer had twenty five handbags in her closet. Wow, <laughs> that is that is remarkable. So this wasn't a matter. This was a matter yeah. of, you know, being able to get access to more yeah. without feeling guilty, you know, still feeling good about the environment without their husband saying, 
you know, why the heck do you need another handbag? You've got 25 perfectly good ones right in your closet. Yeah. So, um, so it was a, it was an interesting concept, but we yeah. were the first to pioneer um, that whole concept, which was fun. Hmm. Yeah, I could see that. And the point you made with motivating employees, you paint that big picture, and I guess you do the same thing for the designers who are coming on. You paint that big picture uh, for them. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I could see that right off the bat because you even see the people, the Emmys or whatever, they probably rent some of that really extravagant jewelry and everything else. So I guess that makes perfect sense to have the, yeah. the high-end handbag. So what is another big lesson or story from the new bag bar or steel? Because I also want to get to full circle. But I know you have a ton for, for this one. <laughs> yes. Um, so one of them was... Um, you know, with, with the lawn, the movie of Sex in the City going out, two things happened. One was sales immediately went through the roof. Um, but the other thing that happened was our theft rate also went through the roof. Hmm. Not only the, the, the dollars, but the rate tripled. Wow. And uh, that was completely unexpected to us. Um, and so it was like, you know, these women would go to the movie, bring their boyfriends who thought, boy, great, I can get a thousand dollar handbag for 80 bucks and then sell it or whatever. So um, that was an interesting learning um, just in human behavior. And, and we hadn't put a lot of, a lot of effort into the screening and, and you know, theft protect, protection, things like that. And so, so we did a um, ton of effort. Um, and so we broke it out into three chunks, you know, upfront screening, um, in the middle, keeping their cards active. And at the end, once they fell off, being aggressive at going after them. So we didn't look like a patsy, um, you know, who would, you know, give their if bags. You make up. an example of someone, right? Well, exactly. Cause word gets around. Um, so we did that and then we actually, so. So the theft rate more than um, more than tripled with Sex in the City. Through our efforts, we reduced it by half from where it started from. Oh, really? Yeah. So ton of progress, and the timing was great because the movie launched on May thirty first, and so when the recession hit in September, and all the other retailers were experiencing increased, you know, non-payment, we were actually going the other way because of those things that we were putting in place. So that was an interesting, interesting learning for us. And also, people can't afford that the bag, so they have to go to you to to rent it. But initially, it's got to be a big shock. How do you, like, financially? Do you have insurance on those things? How do you actually sustain that? No, initially we had insurance, but it, of course it was unsustainable, right? Because they have to make money. Yeah. So all we were doing was increasing our costs uh, because they kept jacking the rates. So. You know, the key is one of the things that, that, that I always do anywhere is put in the key measures for tracking. So one of the first keys was to identify that it was happening. And so right, up, right away we saw the theft rates start to go up, so we got to put things in place. And, um, you know, we, we addressed it. You know, I talked to the head of, of um, security at Dell Computer. I talked to the folks at PayPal, I talked to the folks from a lot of different companies mm -hmm. and you know what were they doing, what are yeah. the things we could do and we, we came up with um, mm -hmm. you know, our approach. We developed a model, a guy that actually worked at, at PayPal had left and so he developed a model for screening up front. Um, so we did, we did all those things and um, made a huge impact. Yeah, so you went to the top people and just implemented what they were doing. Yeah, it was it was something that you know I hadn't had experience with before because you know at all those retailers that I mean our theft was with the initial order you know as long as a card was good at the time they placed the order right you know we didn't care but for a rental company or a subscription company it's the ongoing piece and so yeah I called people I said well who's who's good at this how do I quickly learn and get up to speed and how can they you know we adapt that so. You know, that was the approach that, uh, you know, that, that we took. Yeah. So any other big lessons from the new bag bar or steel before Full Circle? You know, uh, the structure that we took on the fundraising was a challenge because we were, we were really capital intensive. 
So with the rental business, you know, with the retail business, you buy your inventory, you sell it, and you make your entire profit, right? With the rental business, you buy your, your product, so you're out the, the cost. Now you're renting over time and you're negative until you break even. Now after that, it's pure profit. Right. And so when you're growing fast, you're deep in the negative on that. So, so we had to give rights to each of the major shareholders um, that ultimately after the recession hit, um, created a really challenging situation. Um, and you know the investors really didn't know the fashion business um, and so it was just it was tough uh, at the end to to navigate through that. Um, but um, but why was the recession it, tough? Because I thought it would it increased during the recession. You know, you would you would think that uh, that it would, and we saw some of that. But there were also a lot of other people that that pulled back. And so you know, if if you're if you're pulling back or you're feeling guilty about everybody else being you know tough. It was funny. We there, there was a survey that people did of, you know, what what is the most expendable thing or the least expendable thing that you're going to cut back on during this recession? And at the one end of things that people can't give up were like their cell phone, you know, cable TV. Literally at the other end was fashion handbags. <laughs> literally. So I mean, let's face it. You you can get by without the latest fashion handbag this month. I right? can personally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the the net net was was down, but the bigger impact was that we couldn't raise money to fund the next the next stage, yeah. and so we had to you know, scramble. So we said, okay, we've got to come up with a new channel of sales, or we're going to be out of business. So, you know, like at classmates, we went through the strategic planning thing and we said, okay, what are the opportunities? What can we do? One of the things we learned is that, that our customers had $1.4 billion worth of inventory in their closets. So we looked at assets, things that we had, that was one. The other one is that we're really good at authenticating and refurbishing handbags hmm. because we had to be right. with our handbags coming back. They so get said, worn out, yeah. Yeah. So we said, why not? And we had customers asking us, can I send you my handbags? So this is great. This, this aligns demand with what we're good at. And so we launched what we called member inventory sourcing. And it was a home run, you know, from, from day one. And that's, that was a big, you know, was driven by the recession. It made sense for them. It was a big winner. And, um, you know, that's what you got to do. Um, you know, when you, you know, when I talk to people when I'm hiring, I say, look, you know, we need people in this, these early stage companies that are flexible. You can't be um, rigid and things are going to, big boulders are going to fall right in your path. <laughs> and there are some people that are going to be deer in the headlights, you know, and they're going to run right into it. But what I'm looking for are people that can say, there's a big boulder in the path. So do we go around it? Do we go over it? Do we go under it? Do we blow it up? Do we move it? Right. What do we do? Um, yeah. And you know that's the mentality yeah. that you've got to because you're gonna you're gonna deal with all kinds of things and yes. you know you've got to embrace the challenge, and not be intimidated or overwhelmed by it. Yeah, and you talked about one of the most important things is getting the right people on the bus. What are some Absolutely. of the things you implement in the hiring process so you make sure you get those people? Yeah, so, so these days, this is where technology is great, I rarely hire any senior executive that I don't have some connection with. So the first order is, you know, I've worked with them, great, I know exactly what they're like. The next one is I've worked with somebody or know somebody really well who's worked with them. So if I'm talking to someone, one of the first things I do or I get a resume, I go to LinkedIn and I see what connections we have. and. You know, the majority of the time, there are common people that we know, and um, it's priceless. I'll give you my best example of that. I saw this woman come through, and she was a rock star on paper. And so I go to LinkedIn, I see that there's, you know, she used to purport to a guy that I knew quite well. So I called him up and I said, hey, you know, you remember such and such? And, and he said, he said, yeah. Um, and he said she used to report to me and I said well she looks great she looks you know for exactly what we're looking for and he said don't even talk to her and I said why 
He said, because if you do, you will fall in love with her and you will hire her and 30 days later, you will regret it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, because I trusted the guy. Right. So I said, all right, I, I dodged a bullet. Um, so it, it's the connections and yeah. interviews, as you probably know, are yeah. not the best way to, you know, even... It's hard. In about 50%, maybe, yeah. give or take. Um, and so it's, it's really the networking yeah. and knowing yeah. or having somebody that knows people. That's a good one. So you have to look at past performance and find someone who's, you know, experienced that past performance. Yeah. That's the best predictor yeah. of future performance. All right, I like that. Um, yeah. So tell me about Full Circle. So now how do you transition from New Bag Bar or Steel to Full Circle? And tell people what first Full Circle is because I don't know if it's obvious from the name exactly what it is. Yeah, probably not. So it's a, it's a farm-to-table delivery service. It's pretty cool. Yeah, of organic produce and artisan groceries. And so I took a couple years off after Avell. Bag bar steel. I how dare you? <laughs> I needed to decompress. It was pretty intense. You know, I have to ask this. So where is the you know kind of going full circle from the beginning? You said okay, you know you're single, you're young, you're working whatever twenty four hours a day, you know Land's End. So where does your wife fall? I mean, you get married, you have kids. Where does the wife fall in the place when you start to have to get some balance in your life? Yeah, well, so one thing, you know, I'm, I'm hopefully working more efficiently now than, than back then. Um, and getting, you know, I mean, you, you use the hours early in the morning before the kids get up, you use the hours late at night, the kids go to sleep, and, um, you know, I try to be pretty efficient in the day. So I, I try to get home every night, you know, by 6 o'clock, spend time with the kids. I, I try not to miss if they have ball games or concerts or things like that. I, I make the majority of those and, you know, you work around it. I mean, with yeah. the internet and connectivity, you know, I'm always connected. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can be efficient. So what do you do in those years off then before Full Circle? Yeah. So, I mean, the first year I really spent a ton of time with the family. We went to Europe for three weeks. Um, went to every, you know, took the kids to school every day. I mean, really a ton of time. And then did a little bit of consulting. And, you know, the second year I started to do more consulting. I started to consult with Full Circle. Um, and then in September of that second year, I actually started working full time as a consultant. And then I started full time as CEO in January mm -hmm, mm -hmm. after two years. So, um, you know, I looked at and talked to a lot of companies um, in terms of what do you do next? Right. right? I mean, I, I had some great experiences with some great companies. And, and so, you know, I wasn't just looking for a job. Um, and, and I talked to some great companies and talked to some of the bigger companies. And, you know, I just wasn't ready to go back to, you know, billion dollar plus company. Um, I mean, even as CEO, you can only move so fast. And, you know, and, and it's, it's tiring, you know, to, yeah. so I love the, the young, you know, you've got some critical mass, but you're still very flexible. So I was mm -hmm. looking at companies in, yeah. in that range and I wanted something that had a more mission driven component, yeah. um, you know, to where you could feel good about it, make a difference in people's lives. And, um, you know, I loved, uh, full circle, uh, you know, what they're doing, it's mission driven, it's eating healthy, better for the environment, sustainability, yeah. you know, all of that. So yeah. it was just, and, you know, I love the fact that we were as big as we were serving, you know, less than 5% of the country. We, we did not have um, a lot of best practices were not being applied yet. Um, so I saw a lot of low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just thought this is a great fit and uh, decided to join. First year was you know, kind of putting a lot of things in place, you know, some cleanup, getting things. Yeah. yeah, so what do you do first when you when you come in and now you're CEO? What do you do? Well, so again, start with the people. What do we need? Um, you know, hired a head of marketing. I hired a CFO pretty quickly. Um, had to make some changes of people that were here in senior management. Um, and then look at, you know, what do we need to do? Here it was pretty clear. Um, you know, our financial situation was not ideal. 
Um, and so there was a great sense of urgency to strengthen the balance sheet. So, you know, put some things in place from a marketing standpoint, spend, process, things like that. Um, put measures in place, goals, similar to at Nordstrom. You know, there's actually a lot of similarity. Um, and then started to execute. And then we got to the point where, okay, we've got these things in order. We made a ton of progress from 2012 to 2013 in terms of profitability and moving the measures, the, the key performance indicators. So we said, now we're ready to, to raise money. You know, we've got a strong enough position where we can get a decent enough valuation, um, you know, where the investors will do well. We don't have to give away the whole company to raise money. Um, and we are one of a handful of companies in this space that could own it. I mean, the way th this space right now is, is one of the last big undisrupted areas of the internet. And, you know, when I say undisrupted, that is changing as we speak. There's a lot of interest, a lot of investment in food that's going on right now. And so we believe that we are one of a handful of companies that can be the leader in this space. Yeah. And healthy it's, food uh, specifically. Pardon? Healthy food specifically. Yes. No, that's right. That's right. Um, and so, so that's where we're at. So our goal is, you know, raise a significant round, make a lot of changes to the business. We think there's going to be a roll-up happening in the not too distant future. And, you know, our, our goal is in three to five years, we're going to be the dominant player in this multi-billion dollar market. It's a subscription business too, right? It is, yes. Which is one of the things that people like about it. You know, I can subscribe and now I don't have to think about and pick out and worry about it. I mean, we, we deliver, if you do nothing, you get a curated box of organic produce every week. Yeah, so what's in it? Tell, just describe a little bit. What, what do people get? Yeah, it can, be, it can be just about anything. It changes based on time of year, you okay. know, from greens to... Uh, root vegetables, the stone fruit, um, and so you know it's it's whatever's in season. Um, we try to be as local as possible. Yeah. Although you know our first criteria is it's what you want. Yeah. So most people want more than kale in February in Washington. So you know. So is we, it like in Chicago? Can I get it, or is it only the surrounding areas where you are in Washington? Yeah, today we are in California, Washington, and Alaska. Okay. But we aspire to be nationwide. Yeah. And so, you know, if we talk in three to five years, hopefully we'll be, you know, we'll have a national footprint. All right. Five years, we're redoing the interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I know we have a few more minutes, Michael. So I want to know who are some of your mentors and the best advice they've given you? Yeah, you know, Land's End, I spent the, my first 15 years at Land's End, and in the early years, um, I learned a lot there, and, you know, Bill Ferry um, was terrific. Uh, he, uh, his background, he's a merchant by heart, although he really was running Land's End when I joined. Um, you know, Gary Comer was still CEO, but Bill was the one that was there day to day. And, you know, what I learned from him was a great balance of leadership. You know, being able to inspire people, still being tough when you needed to be, being clear on goals, asking good questions and tough questions. And he was a great mentor as well. He loved to teach and, you know, sit down and he would ask you questions and walk you through, you know, really an answer that you didn't know that you had, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, what was one so of the tough was, questions he asked you? Do you remember? Well, um... You know, I mean, you know, there were things like, um, you know, sales would be off, you know, some week. Um, and, you know, a lot of times it was because something that we did in terms of the, um, you know, the list or the selection or something like that. And, you know, early on there were times when he would ask, see things right away, and I wouldn't know the answer. Well, I learned really quickly, I am going to be on top of it, and I'm going to know the answer before he does, or before he asks. Um, but, uh, you know, he was, he was great. Um, another guy, David Zentmeyers, you know, I worked directly for, M, you know, Stanford MBA. Um, and again, you know, very analytical mind. Um, 
kind of soft spoken, um, but still, you know, inspired you. you. You really wanted to do well for him. Um, and so, you know, they, they were great. Um, you know, Dan Lynch was another one early on. Um, so I, I had some great, great mentors uh, early in that yeah. process. Yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing that. And so I have one last question. And then just tell people where they can find you. What's the, the website for the, the company that you're CEO of now so people can check it out? Yeah, so fullcircle.com. Um, you know, it, uh, you can always probably Google organic produce delivery Seattle and we would show up, but fullcircle.com is the URL. Yeah. And you can find us there. Um, you know, also on LinkedIn, of course, um, which is a great resource and uh, use that all the time. Yeah. Uh, so, Michael, my last question is, you know, throughout this, your whole career, what's been one of the most proud moments professionally and personally? You know, those questions are always, always so hard. Um, you know, I guess uh, probably when I was named CEO at Land's End and, and when Gary made the announcement in the gym. Yeah. You know, I just felt, I mean, these were people that I knew well and, you know, looked up to and thought highly of. And, you know, to get such an enthusiastic response, um, you know, just felt good, yeah. right? Um, so, but, I mean, I guess the other things that I really get excited about is when people that, that report into me do well. You know, I, and, and when I tell people, when I give them a promotion, you know, I say, look, if you feel power right now, I've made a mistake. You know, what you should feel is a tremendous sense of responsibility and be thinking about your team and your people and what you will be measured on is the output of your team. Mm -hmm. You know, what you do individually doesn't matter other than producing great results as a team. Yeah. And so when I see people, so there is a woman who was an accounting uh, at Land's End, and I moved her into circulation, and I knew she was bright in accounting, and I moved her into circulation, um, you know, named her head of the kids' business, and she was terrific, extremely bright. I brought her to Nordstrom. Um, you know, she ultimately ended up founding her own company wow. and growing it and building a team and selling it and doing extremely well. Um, so stories like that are just yeah. really exciting, and you know, mean far more to me than, you know, any individual success that I might, might yeah. have. Um, you often find that with the big company, like PayPal, like the founding team, they go on to found other companies because, you know, because of that. So if you think I should be interviewing her too, let me know. Um, but, you know, Michael, this has been so valuable. I know um, we're, we're about out of time. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Really enjoyed it, Jeremy. And, and, you know, for another Badger, you know, great to just have the connection. That's right. Uh, so, yeah, good luck. And hopefully we can stay in touch. And you know, Five years. Know. I'm going to put on my calendar right now. <laughs> Sounds good. I look forward to it. All right. Thanks, Michael. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.